This episode is part of the transformational podcast Systems in Motion. If you want to learn more about the leverage points, please listen to the opening episode. In this interview, we learn from Dominic that one particular resource that is available almost everywhere is still an abundant resource for us humans. There is even a math here for this resource and what serious consequences this has you can find out now. Hello and welcome to another episode of the GCM Compendium 2021. In this episode we will interview Dominic Dittrich. He has dealt with the subject of sand. To be precise, with sand mining worldwide, as can be heard in the title. It seems to have a great impact on our environment. Mr. Dittrich, the first question that pops into my mind is why should sand be a problem? Sand is everywhere. And when I think of the desert, there's plenty of it. This question often comes up about sand. Of course, a lot of sand exists on the Earth's surface. However, we are talking about sand that can be used by the industry, especially by the construction sector. And unfortunately, most desert sands are not available for this purpose. The sand is too fine and too round grinded, so it does not bind well and is therefore useless to produce cement or concrete. Other products can also not or only partially be produced with sands from deserts. But, as you also mentioned, sand really is everywhere. We use sand in the metal industry, in ceramics, glass manufacturing, paints, electronics, in construction and many many more. This makes sand to be the most used natural resource after water and we exploit it globally with increased extraction. This leads to multiple environmental problems. Interesting. I did not know that. So, how much sand is mined worldwide and where is it extracted? It is often not possible to say for sure how much is mined, because, especially in developing countries, data about it is not available or only available for certain years. According to a study by Steinberger, a value of between 47 and 59 billion tons is estimated per year. The estimation is often made using indicators. The most significant of these is the production of cement, because 6 to 7 tons of sand and gravel are used per ton of cement. Often, one can deal with those figures or classify them accordingly. The UN gave a good example of the extraction in one of its publications from 2014, which I will quote verbatim. The sand used only for concrete in 2012 provides enough material to build a 27 by 27 meter high and wide wall once around the world. And that shocked me. <laughs> you can see the global scale more from that. And now where does all this sand come from? It comes from both land and from the sea. But anyway, in developing countries, sand mainly comes from rivers and floodplain deposits. These are easier to extract and do not require further processing. The water grinded sand is well suited for the production of semen and thus concrete and does not have to be desalinated like sand from the beaches or from the sea. Interesting, especially the example with the wall makes clear to me how much sand mankind uses. Sorry for interrupting, just a quick addition. A 2015 report by Swanson found that China consumed more cement between 2011 and 2013 than the entire United States in the 20th century. That's crazy. And what exactly are the environmental impacts of sand mining? And perhaps another or supplementary question. Does sand mining also influence the climate? Let's start with the climate. Of course, sand mining has an impact on the global climate. Not so much the mining itself, but the manufacturing process. Worldwide, the production of concrete contributes between 5 to 8 percent of the global CO2 emissions, more than all air traffic together, or more than the annual emissions from Canada, Australia, Italy, France, and Germany combined. Above all, the environment and the affected ecosystems with the provided ecosystem services are threatened. First of all, mining has direct consequences on flora and fauna. The composition of the soil substrate changes and so does the entire riverbed after excessive mining. As a result, habitats are lost, water turbidity is increased, which ultimately has negative effects on the photosynthesis rate of the plants. 
as the outcome of the interventions, many abiotic factors can change also, so that the ecosystem collapse or changes too much so that a large number of living organisms can no longer survive there. The altered conditions can create fault lines, increase the velocity of the water and cause breathing bridges to collapse. The local population is also threatened by mining activities as they affect the water availability as well as the water quality. When a river or a lake is mined for years or with heavy machinery, it can lower the groundwater levels and pollute it. Drinking water become less available and adaption to droughts become more difficult. This phenomenon is already seen in many places such as the Kashmir region of India. That's shocking, but are there regulations that would enable sustainable mining? Often there are no and hardly any regulations on sand mining in developing countries. Sand is a free resource. As a result, Illegal sand mining exists in many countries, sometimes even as whole organizations like the Sand Mafia in India or illegal sand mining on beaches in Morocco. This causes great damage to the environment and often the extreme cases are known but are undermined by corruption. As already mentioned, there is little available data on sand mining and trade. Therefore, many governments are often unaware of how drastic the situation is or can become. When we talk about implementing leverage points, information sharing leverage point six, would be one of the most important levers. Because secure information that is accessible to decision makers and other key stakeholders could be used to work on different policy levels. For example, at the described leverage point 5. Rules. To give incentives, introduce penalties and set up monitoring systems that are clearly lacking. Developing countries in particular often have neither the resources nor the necessary staff with the appropriate expertise to introduce and implement adequate monitoring systems. It could be changed by these two leverage points and or with the introduction of global standards for the sand market. So what could a functioning monitoring system look like and how could it be developed? How could incentives ensure that the situation improves. To establish a monitoring system, we first need data about the region. A river, for example, carries a certain amount of substrate every year, and this should not be exceeded. Leverage point 12 constants, parameters and numbers could play a role here. Specific parameters have to be developed, as well the limit of maximum extraction to lower the impact to the environment. Trade also needs to be better monitored. For example, Singapore, the country with the highest import of sand, recorded 570 million tons of sand as imports. Yet the export figures of neighboring countries show that 637 million tons of sand exported to Singapore. This makes an underestimation of 120 million tons. Illegal sand imports may also play a role here. So, incentives together with appropriate taxes on sand could make alternatives more attractive. What alternatives do we have to sand mining? There are some substitutes that can be used, but as globalization progresses and the population continues to grow, more and more pressure is being put on our resources, especially on sand. Using much less sand would be an alternative. This would mean making better use of our existing structures. To build new structures, old ones could be recycled. Crushed granite or quarry dust can serve as substitute products to produce concrete. Sometimes concrete with quarry dust perform even better. Other materials can also be used, such as straw, wood or bamboo as a replacement. Furthermore, there are only a few promising methods to make desert sand usable. These are mostly expensive and will take years to be used or to make a significant contribution to the global demand. So in conclusion, with the right levers, there is much that can be changed at leverage point 6, 5 and 12 to address the leverage points again. Thank you very much. Perhaps there will be a change in thinking, so that our hourglass will not run out. Thank you for your interesting contribution, Dominic, and thanks for listening. <laughs>